Okay, this is the Jeff Picaro shuffle. We're going to run this groove down. I almost wish they didn't name it after him uh, because there's no way in the world I can get this to sound like it did when he played it. But I'm going to give it my best shot at explaining it to you so you can um, use it and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, get it under your thumb. Um, I mentioned before that there are some cool exercises to do for this on the pad, believe it or not. And I'll use the snare drum for now to demonstrate what needs to be practiced or what can be practiced on the pad. Um, and, you know, in case you can't get behind your kit to practice, this is a good exercise to do for this particular groove to get it done on the pad. Basically, we're going to right now play the right hand pattern, which is a broken triplet pattern. It is uh, four groups of triplets with the middle note of each triplet left out. So if you count your triplets, one, uh, and two, uh, and all of the uhs are left out. If you count one triplet, two triplet, all of the trips are left out. So let's just get the right hand pattern for right now. Here it is. So that's one uh, and two uh, and three uh, and four uh, and. Very important to make sure you take care to accent the downbeats and all of the ands should be unaccented. And you need this and any groove, you need to get a good variance between the volumes of the notes in order to get the groove to actually feel good, okay? You don't want to play the right hand like this. Or even like this. More like this. Okay? The next step, we left all the uhs out or the middle notes of the triplet. Those are now going to be inserted with the left hand. Okay? What you want to do is, and this is important, this is an important fact of this groove. You want to get that left-handed unaccented note equal in volume to the right-handed unaccented note. Because when we split the hands, you're going to want them to be close in volume so that you have a nice flow going on, okay? Again, the dynamics play a crucial role in making this thing, this groove or any groove, feel good. You've got to pay strict attention to dynamics, okay? So here's what you want now. One uh, and two uh, and three uh, and four uh, and after you get that down, that's that's a great exercise to practice on the pad. Just getting the hands where they need to be volume wise, and then once you get behind the kit. You can then split the hands, right hand on the hi-hat, left hand on the snare. And when you play your accented notes with the right hand, you're going to want to take care to play them on the, uh, the shank of the stick right here, okay? Right where it starts to taper, all right? The unaccented notes, you're going to want to play with the tip. That's going to look like this. One and two and three and four. And that left hand comes in. You're going to, again, want to try and match the volume of the unaccented note in the right hand pattern. You're going to get this. One and two and three and four. Now, the next thing you need is the backbeat on beat three. 
want it and two it and three it and four it and want it and two it and three it and four it and and what you're going to want to try and do at first is leave the uh or the middle note out of beat three and just pick it up again on beat four. So it's going to sound like this. Wanna and tua and three and four. Once you get proficient at that, you can then try and add the little grace, or the, I'm sorry, not grace, but ghost note right after the backbeat on three. Okay, that'll sound like this. Wanna and tua and three and four. Again, notice the left hand barely making a sound. And a lot of people will argue, why bother playing it if you're going to play it that soft? No one's going to hear it. Maybe so, but I'll tell you what, they're going to feel it. Even if they don't hear it, they'll feel it. Okay, It'll, it's going to add motion, and it will be felt and create a tremendous groove. Okay, so the next thing we're going to want to do is add that Bo Diddley kick drum. Okay. So if this is your tempo, one, two, three, four, and, uh, 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 and, counting it, it's one it and two it and three it and four it and one it and two it and three it and four it, one it and two it and three it and four it and one it and two it and three it and four it. Now you're gonna notice. Now that we're putting the kick drum in, we're getting closer to the regular speed of the song. And the hands are getting much quicker. So you're, again, you're going to want to take care to practice these dynamics on the pad at first. Try to get them up to tempo there first, then bring it behind the kit. Okay? So here it is with the kick drum pattern. One, two, one, two, three. One other thing I want to add is you'll notice the pickup going back to the beginning. Da dum, da um, um, da um, um, da gum. All right, so you got to get that kick drum to play the pickup going back in to uh, the beginning of the groove again. One other thing I can add when you're doing the kick drum pattern, it's a good idea to add one kick drum note at a time because the hands are so crucial to making this groove happen and get that forward motion and that great feel, that the kick drum, okay, should be added in bits and pieces, just to make sure you're maintaining the proper groove with the hands. If you add too many kick drum notes at a time, your attention gets detracted from the hands because you're focusing so much on getting the kick drum pattern right, and before you know it, your hands are to hell and gone, and then you got to come back and piece it all together. So you're better off doing one note at a time with the kick drum uh, when you're adding it to the hands, okay? Okay, so there you have it, Jeff Beccaro Shuffle. Uh, well, kind of the Jeff Beccaro Shuffle. Nobody plays it like he does. Um, but if you have any questions, go. Uh, you can either shoot up a comment on the video, and I'll, I'll try and get to it as soon as I can, or you can go to cidrumming.com and email me through the website. So I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll be back soon with another lesson video for you. Have a good one.
I uh, just figured I would take uh, this opportunity to go over some of my gear with you. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions on, hey, how do you get the, that sound out of your toms? Uh, what kind of gear you use? What kind of head you use? What kind of kit is that? Um, and I figured, you know, this tune, I got a pretty nice uh, drum sound on it. So I figured I would take the opportunity now to uh, give you some insight as to what I'm using. Um, let's start with the drum kit. The drum kit is a Sonar uh, Force 3007 kit. The sizes are 8x7, you got your 10x8, you got your 12x9, 12 12x9, 12 you got your 14x11, and you got your 16x16 16 16 floor tom, which for this particular tune I did not use, I didn't even have it mic'd up. Uh, the drums are all maple, and for the price, are ridiculous. The quality of the drums is absolutely amazing. So basically, just a brief story about how um, I settled on sonar. You know, you listen to you listen to a lot of tunes, you listen to a lot of people play, um, and every once in a while, in listening to, to tunes a drum kit would really catch my ear and I would say, oh my God, that kit sounds unbelievable. What kind of kit is that? And almost every time that would happen to me, almost every time I would hear a kit that would really make me say, gee, I got to find out what kind of kit that is. Whenever I found out what it was, it was sonar. So I said, you know what? It's been a long time coming. I've I haven't played Sonar, I haven't tried Sonar yet, so let me give them a shot. So I figured what I would do is I would start off with their midline kit um, for financial reasons, as well as I believe that if you can find a company that makes a tremendous midline kit, their top of the line kit could only be obviously that much better. So I ended up with the Force 3007 kit, and upon taking it out of the boxes, the first thing I noticed was the finish. Now, this is just a plain black finish. This is a piano black lacquer finish. But this lacquer finish looks just as good as some of the black lacquer finishes I've seen on upper line kits. It just looks great. Sometimes, you know, you get those kits, the midline kits, and they uh, you get like that wavy effect. Not here. You don't see that here. Uh, the other thing is... Um, Obviously, and first and foremost, the sound. As soon as I tuned up the first drum, and mind you, when I when I tuned them up for the first time, they had Remo UT heads on them, which is not the top of the line Remo head. And I tuned the drum up and hit it, and I could tell just by hitting it the first time the articulation, the tone for a midline kit was just remarkable. I, I couldn't get over it. I couldn't wait to get the whole kit set up. So once I got the whole kit set up, I'm playing it. And then my next thing was, well, oh my God, I got them to sound like this with UT heads on it. Wait till I go to a top of the line head. Uh, normally I use Remo Clear Ambassadors on the tops and the bottoms of the tops. And I use a coated am ambassador on the snare drum with a medium snare side hazy on the bottom. So ambassador coated on the top on the snare, medium snare side hazy on the bottom. So once I got the whole kit set up, I'm playing it. And then my next thing was, well, oh my God, I got them to sound like this with UT heads on it. Wait till I go to a top of the line head. Your eight and your 10. I said, you know what? I never really, I never really gave it much thought. You know, you get caught thinking in that box all the time. And I just never gave it really any thought. And he explained to me the reason is because the smaller drums, because of their size, tend not to resonate as long as the larger drums. So to bring them closer to the duration and resonance to the lower toms, he advised to try putting diplomats on the bottoms of the 8s and the 10s. And that's exactly what I did. So right now, I've got clear ambassadors in the tops of all my toms and clear ambassadors on all the bottoms of the toms, the rezzo side, except for the 8 and the 10, which have diplomats on them. Thinner head, more sustain, 
and uh, the drums just sing. Uh, let's talk about Remo for a second. Heads and sticks to me are the most important things. Um, once you get a drum kit, you're pretty much good to go for a long time uh, with your drum kit. A great drum kit such as this one would, would last you for the rest of your life. Uh, but when it comes to sticks and heads, you really have to make sure that what you choose to use is consistent. So you get the same sound that you're looking for every single time. And obviously high quality. And so, you know, so they last longer. And first and foremost, they have to sound great. And I've tried all the other heads. And after trying all the other heads, it always seems like I always went back to Remo because I was just never quite as happy with my sound as I am when I have Remo heads on the kit. And uh, I've used Remo heads on all the different brands of kits that I've played, and they sound phenomenal on all of them. So my method of thinking is, well, if that's the case, why would I ever use anything else? I literally have been using Remo heads since I was nine years old. My drum teacher would always say to me, look, there's no need to look any further when it comes to drum heads. Don't even bother. Just use the Remo heads. They're the best made. And of course, you know, as you get older, you're like, well, did the guy really know what he was talking about? You know, let me see. Let me check out the other heads. So I did. And he was right. We always come back to Remo because, well, for me anyway, they are just, uh, you know, they're, they're what get me that sound that I'm looking for. Uh, the next thing we need to talk about are sticks. Now, I use Vic Firth sticks. Again, I, I, I mean, I've been using these sticks since, since I first found out about them, which was like back in high school. Um, and again, the consistency of the sticks, you never find a banana you never find one that's just somehow not right. They're always balanced. So again, with that in mind, if you find sticks that are like that, they feel great in your hand, um, why bother going anywhere else? Right now, an interesting story, right now I am using the American Heritage 5A. I was an American Classic 5A guy for a long time. Just a tremendous all-around stick. Good for all styles. Uh, great for jazz. Great for fusion. Little light for rock, but it'll still work. Uh, I don't play a lot of hard rock stuff, so I stick with the 5A. And let's get back to what I was saying before. I was an American Classic guy for a long, long time. Uh, and those, of course, are the, the Hickory sticks the 5A uh, model Hickory stick. And I was reading an article. Was it an article? Or no, I was watching, I believe it was on the Todd Zuckerman video that he that he just came out with. Uh, and he was talking about sticks. I think that's where I, I saw it, but don't quote me. It might have been an article. At any rate, he was talking about how he started to play maple because the maple, the nature of the wood... It doesn't fray in the middle. You know, sometimes from rim shots or from hitting cymbals, you'll get like, the, you know, the frayed splinters coming off the middle. And even around the top, it'll start to splinter. And I find that um, that would happen probably within three or four hours of playing. You would start to see the beginnings of them starting to splinter. And he said that he tried the maple sticks because the nature of that wood is where you get the dents and you get the chipping, but you don't get the splintering. And for the way I play, I found, you know, listening to what Todd had to say, I, of course, went out and tried the maple sticks, and I got to say, in all honesty, they lasted, for me anyway, much longer than the hickory sticks. And they, uh, you know, they chip, and they're more apt to... You know, when they give or, and, and when they go and when they're just finished, they just break. The tip will come off uh, and, you know, it'll break off clean at the end. But that's after a lot of playing. So I tend now to sway more toward the maple sticks. And I think that's probably where I'm going to end up staying simply because they last longer to me. 
and you don't have the annoying splinter thing going on in the middle. Another um, piece of equipment that I use that I can't say enough about, this to me, when I saw this, my buddy Steve turned me on to this thing. You know, me and Steve were like, uh, we're constantly going back and forth trying to find for the equipment that we have, the best possible drum sound that we can get. And he asked me one day, did you ever check out this thing uh, for mounting the kick drum mic called the Kelly Shoe? And I was like, I never heard of it in my life. He says, well, listen, I have one. I went to a drum show. I won a second one as a raffle. So why don't you take the one that I have and I'll keep the one that I, that I won at the raffle. And I said, all right, bring it on over. So he brings the thing over, and I, and I ask him, you know, what's the advantage of this thing? He goes, you'll see when, when we put it on. So here it is, and basically what it involves is it's an invention that allows the microphone to be free-floating to mic the kick drum. You can see here that these rubber cords, all right, that are cut to go around the lug and then lead over to the shoe and you have them connecting all the way around the shoe. They keep the shoe floating, and the microphone attaches right to the shoe. So, okay, great. So what does that do? Well, if I had a short boom stand here and had the kick drum mic that way, when you hit the kick drum, your pedal's on the floor. So it's going to send vibration up the little boom stand for the microphone, and you're going to get, or could possibly get, more than likely get, some hum in the kick drum microphone. Not so with this mounting system. The other thing is it keeps the, the kick drum mic in the exact place you want it every time you record. So it's not like it's going to be over a half inch this way or a half inch that way, and if you ever recorded, you know that that can make, that small distance can make a big difference in the sound that you're getting from, from the kick drum. So now the sound that I get from the, in this microphone from my kick drum is pure kick drum sound. Now you can also mount this Kelly shoe inside the drum. These straps, it would involve you unscrewing the, uh, the nuts on the lugs and they come with little like leather attachments that go between, you know, the nut and the, the screw itself. And these attach on the inside. So if you want to get, basically mount this thing permanently on the inside, you can do that. And you can literally put this thing wherever you want your placement to be inside the drum. When you take the microphone off, you can leave this thing on, pop the drum right in the case, take it out, it's still there. You screw the mic back on, you're ready to go. Absolutely 100% recommended. It's quite phenomenal. And I'm so glad that Steve told me about it because I think this thing is just great. My kick drum has never sounded better. I get, I get no hum inside, you know, in the microphone. And uh, just really creates a nice consistent kick drum sound. And the, and the convenience of the thing is just ridiculous. So that's the Kelly Shoe. You want to check it out, go to kellyshoe.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-S- H-U dot com where you can check that out.